It was a dark time at Nintendo. The original product star designer Gunpei Jokoi had just left the company after the success of the Game Boy Pocket, disappointed with the direction Nintendo was going, and had taken some of Nintendo's best employees to create his own company, Koto Laboratory. This is all from the previous video, and merely a year after his departure, he had died in a tragic traffic accident. What was left of his team back at Nintendo, led by engineer Takehiro Isushi, soldered on. Their first step was to finish the definitive version of the Game Boy, a revision that finally included a backlight and immediately started working on what was next. Even before Jokoi's departure, several people in R&D 1 had started working on what they called Project Atlantis, a new generation Game Boy that will replace the obsolete 8-bit CPU by a 32-bit ARM CPU and finally add the one thing the original device had been so criticized for, a color screen. With such improvements, the Atlantis will not only match a Super Famicom in power, but possibly exceed it in a handheld format. It will be better than a Game Boy. It will be a Game Boy, but more advanced. As the Game Boy Light project wrapped up, everyone was eager to move on to Atlantis, but they were, all of them, deceived, for another handheld was made. Deep in the lands of Kyoto, in the fires of Koto Laboratory, before dying, the Game Master Jokoi had started forging a master handheld, and into this handheld he poured his knowledge, his philosophy, and his will to entertain all life. One handheld to rule them all. Was that a bit too much? <laughs> It is 1998, and president of Nintendo Hiroshi Yamauchi was feeling a bit nervous. The initial sales of the Nintendo 64 in Japan had been disappointing. His corporate stunt with Sony during the development of the disc drive for the Super Famicom, a story that maybe you have heard about, but that maybe deserves its own video as well, had backfired catastrophically, and now Sony had joined the console race with the PlayStation, which was already showing signs of being a true issue for Nintendo. Still, the company was not in any danger. Their grasp on the handheld market with the Game Boy was still absolute. Sega and many others had tried competing with Nintendo there and failed terribly for the same two reasons. No other company had the unique combination of recognizable IPs that Nintendo had, plus a collecting frenzy franchise like Pokemon, plus the vision to understand that the handheld market was won not by bleeding edge technology, but with Jokoi's philosophy of low cost and battery life. And then Yamauchi received a courtesy call by none other than Bandai. It was an old Japanese custom to inform your business partners when you were about to make a move that will affect your relationship with them. And Bandai had been a powerful ally of the Game Boy. But the news they were bringing was basically the worst thing Yamauchi could have possibly expected. Bandai was working on a handheld to compete with the Game Boy. Okay, so Bandai did not have Mario or Zelda, but they had exclusive rights for Dragon Ball, One Piece, and pretty much every major action anime name in Japan at the time. Oh, but they did not have Pokemon, right? They had no franchise that could possibly compete with... Oh no. Oh sh... Wait, 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 but Bandai is in a hardware company, right? They do not have the expertise to make a device. And if they even try, they will make the same mistakes as everyone else, right? They do not have Yokoi's philosophy, right? And then came the real news. Bandai had hired Koto Laboratory, Yokoi's company, to design this handheld. Yokoi had been working on it before dying, and it was now in the hands of ex-Nintendo employee and Yokoi apprentice Yoshihiro Taki. Bandai had everything. We need a Game Boy with a color screen. Now! Yamahuchi-san, yes, Project Atlantis is going into full swing, and we are almost done with Game Boy Light. We just need a couple of years. Hmm. <laughs> you have 10 months. Getting Project Atlantis to product in a year was impossible. The project was too early in development, and only a very simple project could get to market quick enough to beat Bandai. So, once again, and against the wishes of R&D 1, they did some minimal changes to the Game Boy Light and created the Game Boy Color. To say the Game Boy Color from a technological perspective is little more than a revision is not a tremendous exaggeration. Time constraints meant that big improvements had to be axed, instead opting for a bigger memory pool to accommodate for the color sprites, a faster clock on the CPU in the hopes that it will be enough to at least make the console attractive enough until Project Atlantis could be commercialized. 
Most of these stories come from the final chapters of the History of Nintendo Volume 4 by gaming historian Florin Gorges that goes into way more detail on the way different people struggle with their ultra-tight deadline. For example, the physical design of the device had to be conditioned to the ultra-fast development cycle, and lead designer Kenichi Sugino had to abandon the idea of a full redesign and instead focus on some curious smaller detail, which I will explain on the Nebula Companion for this video. The biggest change, obviously, was the screen. Lucky for R&D1, they had been doing a lot of experiments on current color screen technology for Atlantis, and they could use those to retrofit the Game Boy Color. So, how does a liquid crystal display work with different colors? If you have watched my previous video on the original Game Boy, you might remember the basic mechanics of liquid crystals that they use to let through or block light for each individual black and white pixel. Put a Game Boy Color under a microscope and you will notice how each individual pixel is now divided into three subpixels, each one for a primary color. For cheaper and older LCDs, this was simply achieved by adding a color filter somewhere around the mechanism, so then the light coming from each subpixel is as close to the primary color as possible. Now, this technique comes with several challenges in terms of power consumption. For starters, having to draw essentially three times as many pixels means three times as much power. Furthermore, some light is lost when you pass through the color filter. If the loss is too high, the mechanism might necessitate a strong backlight at all times, which even more dramatically increases the power consumption. Add all of this up, and you can see why devices like the Game Gear had such terrible battery life. However, by the time Nintendo was researching Project Atlantis, their screen supplier Sharp had made a lot of progress in manufacturing cheap reflective color LCDs. For those screens, an improved filter that minimizes light loss is placed right before the reflector and a color dyed is added to the liquid crystal itself. All in all, around 50% of the light makes it through the circuit, which allows the device to operate without a backlight for prolonged battery life. Removing the backlight of the Game Boy Light's design was more than enough to compensate for the increased consumption of the subpixel, and so the device was deemed sufficient for two alkaline AA batteries. This pressure to release the Game Boy Color instead of a new generation device caused some major lack of interest in the device, at least within Nintendo. As the American launch of the Game Boy Color approached, the president of Nintendo of America, Minoru Arakawa, was fairly dismayed at discovering that Nintendo had not developed a single launch game for the Game Boy Color, and the general lack of motivation from the team. After a lot of effort, he managed to convince the team to try out and port the original Super Mario Bros. for the Famicom, which was a project that could be finished in a few months. The result was Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, a sadly underrated, very interesting port of the original. Isn't it amazing how something so extraordinarily iconic as the Game Boy Color was just kind of hated by the people who made it? You can see this through the lifetime of the device. Consider the following, if you look at a list of the best-selling monochromatic Game Boy games, you see the trend that has characterized pretty much every Nintendo console where the best-selling games are the result of efforts of their own internal software teams. So it is super interesting to notice that for the Game Boy Color, this trend suddenly breaks. Even if a good number of these games are from Nintendo franchises, there are either ports of older games or developed outside of Nintendo, which reinforces the evidence that, at least for R&D 1, the Game Boy Color was an unwanted addition that they were not particularly proud of, let alone excited to make games for. However, Yamauchi's insistence seemed to pay off. While the Wonders One was moderately successful in Japan, and to this day has a particularly dedicated fanbase, the Game Boy Color seemed to take most of its momentum away, and maintains Nintendo's iron grip on the handheld gaming market on a time when its dominance on console was slipping, possibly to never return. Sadly, with the Game Boy Color releasing barely months after the Game Boy Light, what the team believed was going to be the definite version of the handheld was cannibalized by the color and therefore never made enough numbers to be commercialized outside of Japan, making it extraordinarily rare and expensive to acquire. In fact, I could not find one and had to borrow some clips from friend of the channel, developer and collector Asobi, who recently released a brand new Game Boy game, Super Jetpack DX, which proves that even decades after release, the legacy of this handheld is kept alive. For me, the Game Boy Color teaches us a simple lesson. No matter how well made a product is, a lot of its decisions often came down to impulse personal drama, 
and no matter how iconic it became, its creators might not be super proud of it. Although, there is some genius in doing something like this with such tight time limitations, like the story of how the lead designer found time to fix some small details that people complain about in previous Game Boys Online, or how he hid a small tribute to Jokoi. But you know the deal, I could not fit it on this video, so I spun it off as a companion video for Nebula. Every episode of the series is currently getting an exclusive companion video, so I can cover obscured side notes of the stories, and that means that I get to be less sad over the stuff I have to cut on every video, and you enjoy extra exclusive content while meaningfully supporting the channel while barely spending any money. For those not in the know, Nebula is a streaming service a bunch of us creators started as an expansion pack for YouTube. It's got all our content ad-free and often extended or with companion videos. Original content like my documentary on RuneScape Gold Farmers, my podcast about creator origin stories, and much more from a growing number of creators. 